Hello everyone. My name is Emma Lashley and I am an assistant librarian at Crowdsville District Public Library. A while ago I created a presentation for the library called Native Americans of Indiana and it turned out to be quite popular so I thought I would turn into a larger series about Indiana history. Today I'll be telling you about the history of Indiana from the earliest European explorers to the end of the Revolutionary War. I hope you'll enjoy it and learn a little something along the way. As they say, you should always start at the beginning. And of course, the area that is now the state of Indiana has had people living in it for thousands of years. If you want to truly start from the beginning, check out my Native Americans of Indiana video that I mentioned earlier. But today, we're going to start at the beginning of European history in Indiana. The first recorded European to explore Indiana was René Robert Cavalier de La Salle. He went down the St. Joseph River and camped at South Bend in 1679. Obviously, it is quite possible that other European wanderers made their way into the state sometime in the almost 200 years between Columbus discovering America for Europe in 1492 and La Salle's exploration, but if so, they didn't bother to write anything about it down. During his expedition, La Salle claimed all of the land around the Mississippi and its tributaries for France. La Salle named his new land Louisiana after French King Louis. Traders began to flock to the new land that de Salle had claimed, and forts and trading posts were founded across the state. Fort Miami was built in 1715 at the site that is now Fort Wayne. There was a trading site located there even before the fort itself was built, so it is considered the first European settlement within the modern borders of Indiana. You can visit Old Fort Wayne Historic Park and Museum pictured on the left today, but is actually a recreation of the third fort to stand in Fort Wayne, built by the Americans in 1794 not the original French construction. Fort Wyatnon was built in 1720 near present-day West Lafayette. This is a reconstruction of what it probably looked like based on the archaeological data we have. I highly recommend checking out Fort Wyatnon. They're doing a lot of work out there to uh, make it better for guests visiting and they do a lovely festival in October called Feast of the Hunter's Moon. It is a ton of fun. I definitely recommend it. Another very large fort was built at Vincennes in 1732, although there had been a trading post there as early as 1702. This location quickly grew into the largest French town in Indiana, and it is considered the oldest settled town in the state. Starting around the early 1700s, the English colonists who had been living on the East Coast started to move west into the Ohio Valley. Obviously, the French traders and settlers were not too pleased with this turn of events. So, the French met with the Native American tribes living in the Ohio Valley area and told them that they could only trade with the French. Any tribe who traded with the English would be subject to attack from French military. They also wrote letters to the governors of Pennsylvania and New York informing the governors to keep their English citizens out of the Ohio Valley. The English not only ignored these warnings and continued to travel into the Ohio Valley, but they also retaliated. The English told the Native Americans that the valley belonged to them and not the French. English traders also told the Indians that they would attack them if they caught them trading with the French. The Native American tribes found themselves in a no-win situation. All of this tension leads us to the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War if you live outside the U.S. As you can see here, the majority of the battles of the war stayed well northwest of Indiana, in areas where there were much higher populations of colonists. However, there is one battle that Hoosiers claim is part of this war known as the attack on Fort Miami. And despite it being one of the less than 30 battles that have taken place on Indiana soil, I could find very little about it. Wikipedia has a wonderfully helpful list of battles that took place in Indiana, which includes this attack. But as many of us probably heard from our teachers, you can't trust everything you read on the internet. So I dug into this attack. I was able to find a single reference to it in a book called The Tragic Saga of the Indiana Indians by Harold Allison. And the reason for that became clear upon reading the account of what happened. During the war, two soldiers from the garrison posted at Fort Miami found themselves caught outside the fort's protective wall by a raiding party. They were killed and scalped, and their bodies were left behind, presumably to send a message to those inside the fort. I don't know if I would consider the death of two men as a battle personally. I suppose the Wikipedia author considered it as one, since it was an encounter between the British military and native combatants. I'll allow you to make up your own mind on whether or not Hoosiers should count this as a battle on our soil.
In the end, the French had the help of a larger portion of the Native American population, but the English colonies along the East Coast had more people and supplies that were immediately available to their soldiers. At this time, the English colonies had a population of about 2 million people, while French citizens living in North America only numbered about 60,000. And in case you were curious what those numbers look like, it's something like this, with the orange representing the English and the green representing the French. So you could see that while not every member of the population was fighting, the English had a much larger population to draw on for support. The war ended in 1763 when both France and England signed the 1763 Treaty of Paris, which ended the American, French, and Indian War and the larger global conflict of the Seven Year War. France gave its Canadian territory to Britain, as well as the eastern half of the French Louisiana Territory. France had already secretly given the west half of Louisiana to Spain in the Treaty of Fontainebleau. Britain also received East Florida in a deal with Spain. Indiana now belonged to the English. After the end of the war, the King of England issued a proclamation forbidding any English colonists from sailing west of the Appalachian Mountains. The goal was to appease the Crown's Native American allies and ensure that they began trading solely with the English. But the American colonists who had just fought a war over this territory were understandably not pleased with this mandate. This, along with a number of other aggravating factors, escalated into the Revolutionary War. During the Revolution, there were a series of battles fought in the Midwest, including in Indiana. These series of battles were known as the George Rogers Clark Expedition, as Clark organized and led troops into Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. George Rogers Clark worked as a surveyor in the Ohio Valley and was one of the first pioneer settlers of Kentucky. When the Revolutionary War began, the then Lieutenant Governor of Canada, Henry Hamilton, paid Native Americans living in the Ohio Valley region to attack and kill American settlers. Clark saw this and realized that even if the English were driven out of the East Coast colonies, they would still try and preserve their hold on the Ohio Valley. So, in 1777, Clark traveled to Virginia to meet with the governor, Patrick Henry. Clark asked the governor to allow him to lead a secret mission to attack English forts throughout the Ohio Valley. Henry agreed and gave Clark the financial support for the venture. Clark was authorized to recruit a force of 350 men. He wanted to recruit men from Pennsylvania, Virginia, and North Carolina, but this proved difficult as many of these men were needed elsewhere for the war effort and there was an ongoing debate about whether the Kentucky region was even worth fighting to defend or whether it should be evacuated. Clark was eventually able to raise a small army of about 150 pioneer farmers. They had no military uniforms, only the animal skin clothes they usually wore. Their weapons consisted of short-handled axes, Kentucky long rifles, and knives. These were the normal tools of frontier life rather than the equipment meant for fighting a war. After traveling downriver on the Ohio, the small army reached the falls of the Ohio River at modern-day Jeffersonville, Indiana. They were joined by more men, meaning Clark's army now had about 200 frontiersmen. While the majority of the army continued to head downriver, two men, Father G Pierre Gibault and Dr. Jean Lafont, volunteered to travel to Fort Vincennes, at this time called Fort Zachville, on behalf of the Americans. They convinced the settlement there, still populated mainly by French settlers, to give their support to Clark. After following the river a little further, Clark and his men traveled overland to Kaskaskia, Illinois, where on July 4, 1778, they caught the residents by surprise and took the town without firing a shot. Five days later, a detachment led by Captain Joseph Bowman captured Cahokia. Concerned by Clark's progress, Henry Hamilton, the Canadian Lieutenant Governor, recruited an army of English soldiers, French volunteers, and Native American warriors to travel from Fort Detroit to retake Fort Sackville in Vincennes. There were very few American troops stationed at Vincennes to defend it, so on December 17, 1778, Hamilton retook the fort and the French settlers of the area returned to their British allegiance. But Hamilton made a fatal mistake. In the late fall of 1778, he allowed the majority of his troops to return home for the winter. This was a common practice in 18th century warfare, but it would create the opportunity the outnumber Americans needed. Francis Virgo was a merchant and trader who came to the fort in the fall of 1788. The British took him prisoner for several days, but as a Spanish citizen, he was technically a non-combatant. 
Hamilton, however, was suspicious of Virgo and continued to hold him on parole. Eventually, the French citizens of Vincennes, led by Father Gibault, demanded that Virgo be released or they would cut off the local supplies to the fort. Hamilton had to give in and released Virgo on the condition that he would not, quote, do anything injurious to the British interests on his way to St. Louis, end quote. Virgo was a man of his word, and he traveled down the Wabash, Ohio, and Mississippi River to St. Louis, and then he immediately turned around and headed back up river to meet Clark and Kaskaskia to tell him that the British had taken Vincennes and that they planned to not continue fighting until the spring. Really, Francis Virgo is an under-celebrated hero of the American Revolution in Indiana and the surrounding states, or at least I certainly hadn't heard of him before I was putting together this presentation. In addition to this piece of spy work, he was also the foremost fin financier of the American Revolution in the Northwest. He exchanged Clark's almost worthless continental dollars with hard coin. Virgo was never repaid for his investment, um, and in addition to this, he would later go on to help create Vincennes University, the oldest college in Indiana. A few of you may have heard of him, especially if you're from the Terre Haute area, as Virgo County, Indiana was named after him. After hearing Virgo's news, Clark was determined to capture the fort, so he and his forces of approximately 170 Americans and Frenchmen made an epic 18-day journey from Kaskaskia to Vincennes. It was February of 1779, and most of the land they were crossing was flooded or frozen. The men were forced to sleep in the shallowest pools of water they could find. When they were within about 20 miles of Vincennes, the water became waist high. The troops couldn't hunt for food or cook what they had brought with them, and they soon became weak from hunger. And the water just continued to rise, all the way to chin height. The men wanted to stop, but George Rogers Clark wouldn't let them. Supposedly, he plunged ahead, leading the group, and started singing Yankee Doodle. Finally, within two miles of Vincennes, they reached dry land where they could dry themselves out before heading into the settlement. The American troops arrived in the settlement of Vincennes after nightfall on February 23, 1779. The French citizens greeted them warmly and provided food and dry gunpowder. Inside the fort, Hamilton had only about 40 British soldiers and around the same number of French voluntary militiamen. These French troops were not enthusiastic to fight the Americans once they realized that the French inhabitants of the town outside had decided to support the Americans. Clark came up with an ingenious plan to take the fort as quickly and easily as possible. He had his men surround the fort and raise flags sufficient for an army of 500. The American soldiers then opened fire on the fort, firing as rapidly as they possibly could. The American soldiers were all experienced woodsmen and maintained a rate of fire that convinced the British army that there were really hundreds of men in the woods. To further cause confusion, Clark ordered his men to begin a tunneling project from the riverbank a short distance from the fort. Tunnels like this were typically used to plant explosive charges under walls, so Hamilton would have thought that his fort was in danger of being blown wide open. The American cover fire was highly effective. By 8 a.m. the next morning, seven Britons and zero Americans had been injured. Clark sent a demand for surrender to the fort under a flag of truce. However, Clark wanted nothing less than total surrender with no terms, even going as far as to say that if any of the fort's stores or papers were destroyed, you may expect no mercy, for by heaven you shall be treated as a murderer. Hamilton rejected these terms and returned a more tactful response, saying that neither he nor his garrison were to be prevailed on by threats to act in a manner unbecoming the character of a British subject and he vowed to defend the king's colors to the last extremity. However, this enthusiasm quickly wilted as he realized that he no longer had the support of his French troops and would only last so long against the large group of frontiersmen outside his front gate. After several more hours of fighting, Hamilton made a play for more time, suggesting a three-day truce and a face-to-face -face conference inside the fort. Clark refused, but did offer to meet Governor Hamilton in front of the village church. It was at this point that a Native American raiding party, previously sent out by Hamilton, returned to the fort. Seeing the British flag flying and knowing nothing of the conflict, they hollered and shot off their rifles in celebration of their return and to make their presence known to the British. Fortunately, it also made their presence known to the Americans, who shot the unsuspecting warriors at close range. A few of the warriors were captured and Clark ordered them executed, 
They were led to a street directly in front of the fort, arranged in a circle, forced to kneel, and tomahawked in succession, as they stoically sang a traditional death song. Clark's meeting with Hamilton was only a few minutes later, and Hamilton claimed that Clark showed up bloody and sweating from the execution. Instead of starting the meeting, Clark sat down in an upturned boat and used a great puddle of water to clean the blood from his hands and face. As he washed, he described the execution to Hamilton with, quote, great exultation. Clearly, Clark wanted to give the British a clear idea of what would happen to them if they didn't give up the fort. Clark continued to accept nothing but complete surrender and told Hamilton that if the Americans were forced to storm the fort, not a single man would be spared. The pair almost parted once again, ready to fight it out to the end. But luckily, cooler heads prevailed among their officers, and these men were able to get Clark and Hamilton to finally come to an agreement. The British garrison was granted a bare minimum of terms for the satisfaction of their honor. Officers were allowed their personal baggage, and the bulk of the garrison was to deliver themselves up as prisoners of war and march out with their arms and accoutrements. By about 10 o'clock the following morning, the deed was done. Clark's triumph was complete, although he noted that his men were uneasy about guarding all 79 of their prisoners. British authorities were greatly alarmed by Clark's victory. They feared that many Native American tribes in the region would switch their allegiance to the Americans. And in a number of cases, this did happen. Tribes as far away as Wisconsin sued for peace with the Americans, and the tribes in the Illinois country and the Lower Wabash largely maintained the neutrality for the rest of the war. However, many tribes to the north and east remained enemies of the Americans. Clark also never got the opportunity for a large-scale attack on Detroit, which was his main objective. This would have cut off supplies to the tribes, ending the war in the western backcountry. There was just never enough funding and manpower to make it possible. This was a failure that would haunt George Rogers Clark for the rest of his life. That's about it for the Revolutionary War in Indiana. However, I also wanted to talk about a footnote of history that in my experience, most Hoosiers have never heard of. And that is the time that Spain technically claimed part of the state. In 1781, as the revolution was raging, a Spanish military expedition was sent from St. Louis across Illinois and Indiana to attack the British fort at St. Joseph in Michigan. The Spanish troops and their native allies traveled up the Illinois and Kankakee rivers to what is now Dunn's Bridge, Indiana. There they turned northeast and marched overland to St. Joseph. They took the fort by surprise, racing across the frozen river and taking the fort before the small force of defenders could get to their arms. The Castile flag was raised over the fort, and the Spanish claimed the St. Joseph River. This was the first and last time they would claim land in the Great Lakes region. And it was extremely short-lived. After only a few days, Don Pierre, the leader of the expedition, decided they should return to St. Louis. He feared an attack from the British in Detroit. The expedition retreated back across Indiana and Illinois, and delivered the fort's British flag to the Spanish governor in St. Louis. In 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed, officially ending the war, and settlers began flowing over the Appalachian Mountains into the newly opened Western territories, including Indiana. And I'll be talking about that more in the next part of this series. Uh, it'll be called Road to Statehood, and this will cover the early settlement of the state, conflicts with local Native American tribes, and how Indiana was admitted as the 19th state of the Union. I hope you'll join me to learn more. Just in case any of you are interested, I have a few of my sources. I just wanted to real quickly point out my number one source, uh, The History Museum in South Bend, Indiana. They have a lovely website with tons of great articles about Indiana history and a lot of the, the base of what to cover. Uh, I went off from their website, a lot of great stuff, but uh, here's the rest of the sources in case you're interested. <laughs>